How we live in big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. Jamance Nicholas representing BDGE. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We got another beautiful, gorgeous video coming at you today. Happy Tuesday. I'm filming this on a Friday, so it's about to hit the weekend. The weather's getting nice out here in New York, which means it's officially Mark season, baby, in the vicinity. I start getting hyped during Mark season, so you'll see a lot more enthusiasm out of me during my videos. I get asked a lot, when does Mark season start? When does it begin? There's no official timetable. Mark season is a, it's a feeling, you know? It's like that first day. For, lo for those of y'all that live on, uh, on the East Coast, especially in the Northeast area, the winters are, are brutal. You, you got those winter blues, right? It gets depressing. And then all of a sudden, spring comes out of nowhere. There's that one, you know, I don't even know if this works in like suburban areas, but if you're in a city, there's the that first day where the weather's warm, girls start wearing sundresses, and the whole city, the vibe of the city, I hate using the word vibe because it's like the corniest thing in the world now. Thank you, all the influencers out there. The city is just popping and everyone can feel it and everyone mutually understands it's Mark season. They don't, maybe subconsciously, they understand. Consciously, they might not know it's Mark season, but it's fucking Mark season. It's here and we're getting into 2019 fantasy football. We're talking about our post-hype sleepers, our bounce back players. So guys that we were really excited about going into last year that might've fell off for one of many reasons. Maybe they got hurt. Maybe they just underperformed. It might've been the situation, whatever it may be. But we're looking at this year and they are now undervalued. And you can get them much later in the drafts because of their underperformance in 2018 fantasy football. Today we are breaking down 2019 fantasy football, top post type sleepers and bounce back players. We got a quarterback, we got a running back, we got a couple wide receivers, and then I'll get, I'll break all those guys down in depth and then I'll get into some honorable mention names. If you enjoy the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're hitting y'all with everything 2019 fantasy football throughout the entire summer. Starting in June, we're going five videos a week. I'll break it down for you if anyone happens to give a fuck what those videos are gonna be. Monday and Wednesday will be individual breakdowns such as this with me just sitting at my desk spewing big facts into the camera. There are gonna be a number of different topics, so if you have any suggestions on what you wanna see throughout the summer, make sure you drop a comment down below and I will take that into consideration. I will bring that up to the Big Dogs Committee and then we will deny your request because I already know exactly what I'm gonna be doing throughout the entire summer. Tuesdays, I will be hopping on with Noah. Go follow him at FB God on Twitter. He is producing that entire show. Thursdays will always be Fade the Public, and every Friday will be a mock draft. June 1st, five videos a week. This is the summer that Big Dogs takes over. Top post life sleepers. Let's get it. I did this video last year. And uh, the results were okay. I had Tyler Lockett on the list, I had Matt Ryan on the list, and I had Randall Cobb. We went two for three, but as the summer actually progressed, I got all the way off Cobb because I didn't like what we were hearing from the ankle and the foot injury, and I just thought that was gonna lead to problems. Either way, we were looking good, and I think these guys that I have on this list are fitting the same mold that those guys did. First up on the list, Carson Wentz, quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles. Now this is pretty obvious to most of y'all, but apparently it's not because his ADP right now on draft.com, which is best ball drafts. If you want to use promo code BDGE when you sign up, you'll get three free dollars to go mock draft with and everyone's using real money. So you'll actually be able to play against people that really want to draft right now. So draft.com slash BDGE. He is currently quarterback 13 right now, 114th overall off the board. I find myself grabbing him in the 11th round of every single best ball draft that I do on draft.com. Last year, he finished as the quarterback 23 overall in fantasy. Quarterback 17 in terms of points per game. Now we got Big Dick Nick out of the way, right? So Carson Wentz is going into 2019 with a totally different mindset than he did 2018. The injuries, the, the competition, what are people in Philadelphia saying? It was a weird situation for him last year, but that is not the case in 2019. And he has one thing on his mind, and that's to perform well so I look good on my channel, right? That's what the only thing Carson Wentz obviously cares about. Predicting a, you know, a 2018 letdown was a little bit uh, of a simple task, I would say, for, for fantasy peoples out there. Because of the 2017 supercharged season that he had, it was ridiculously efficient, so you would just automatically assume that it was going to come down to earth. Now, we always say time and time again, when you're looking at quarterbacks, one of the easiest things to predict or you know to help you 
kind of project what a quarterback's touchdown numbers are going to look like in the following years. So look at their, their touchdown rate. What I mean by touchdown rate is the percentage of their passes that actually go for touchdowns, right? And if it's not around the norm, if it's not around their career average, you can predict that to either come back down to around their career average or go up depending on what the year prior was like. In 2017, Wentz threw a touchdown on 7.5% of his throws, which is an, an enormous number. 7.5% of his throws. During their careers, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Drew Brees all hovered around 5.5% touchdown rate. So Wentz, the fact that he was 2% higher, and that might not sound like a lot, but when you're throwing you know, 550, 600 passes a game, 2% is, is a significant amount of more passing touchdowns that you're going to accumulate over the year. So he had nowhere to go but down in that category, right? And that's you had to predict that, and that was the case. His touchdown rate dropped from 7.5 all the way down to 5.2% last year, which is still a very, very solid number. Like I said, those other guys' career marks hover around 5.5%. You're looking at the Eagles' passing volume, and that's what I, what I really like about Wentz. Just his overall offense and this offensive line, which projects to be a lot stronger than it was last year, right? Since he's come in the league, they've attempted 595, 565, and 600 passing attempts, which gives you an average of 590 passing attempts, which, um, you know, I think is a safe number just given the style of offense that the Eagles play. I think we can project for around, you know, 570 to 590, which is something that you look for in, in a quarterback in terms of volume, right? If you were to give him a 5.2% touchdown rate, which is what he did last year and much lower than what he did in 2017, that touchdown rate on that same number of passing attempts, 590, the average, would give him around 31 passing touchdowns for the year. And I think that's a, a pretty safe over-under when you're looking at Carson Wentz and you're projecting to uh, you know, pin the over-under on what his passing touchdown numbers are going to be, maybe like 29 and a half. And that's a fantastic number for someone that you're going to be able to pick around quarterback 15 in fantasy drafts, right now at least. And that's why I suggest you get on draft.com and take advantage of the really skewed early off-season ADPs. And the other part of the game that we didn't get last year, and the reason that he dropped in terms of fantasy points per game at the quarterback position, I think was his rushing ability, right? That was completely scaled back in 2018 thanks to him coming off you know, his torn ACL. His, if you just look, I know this is like a small sample size, but I was looking at his game by game logs and I saw like the last five games of 2018 compared to the last five games of 2017 when he was running the ball, his rushing totals, the last five games of 2018, negative three, negative four, negative two, six and seven yards. The last five games of 2017, that monster year he, he became into the league with, right? 16, 30, 29, 18, and 8. And that's like an average of, you know, 20, 22 yards per game on the ground compared to, you know, zero yards at the end of 2018, which gives you, you know, that extra two points. And you, the, the reason people talk about late round quarterback is because on a points per game basis, quarterbacks in the range of like quarterback 5 to 15, they really only average, you know, 1.5 points per game more than, say, someone that's ranked like seven spots below them at the end of the year. So, him adding those extra, you know, two points on the ground compared to not having them is going to boost Wentz up overall when you look back at the numbers from, you know, quarterback 13 up to like a top seven, six, five. Wouldn't be surprised if he ends up being like a top five fantasy quarterback at the end of uh, 2018. The other thing you got to love about this offense is just what they did in free agency, right? They brought in Deshaun Jackson, a legitimate field stretcher, not someone they keep trying to make fail and I mean keep trying to make work and it just keeps failing miserably right they, they, they Mike Wallace Torrey Smith like Philly just needs to stop fucking treating that one position like it's mad and you could just slot someone in because they have speed when you look at the receiving core that Wentz had during his really big 2017 campaign right there was not a single receiver not a single person that hit 825 receiving yards not Ertz not Alshon Jeffrey not Nelson Aguilar Vegas currently has Deshaun Jackson, Deshaun Jackson's yardage total over under pinned at 900.5. No one hit 825 during his 2017 breakout. Deshaun Jackson is already pinned at 900 yards, basically. Ertz is going to hit that number. Jeffrey will probably get near that, but he'll supplement it with touchdown totals. And Deshaun Jackson, if he can really hit anywhere near that number and stay healthy... Um, and considering Vegas is kind of projecting that, this is going to be a ridiculously explosive offense. Adding Deshaun Jackson, they obviously also uh, added J.J. Arcega-Whiteside early in the draft, one of their draft picks, um, who I think is a phenomenal weapon, but he probably really won't get into the game and make an impact on the offensive side of things. Probably 
not for another year or two down the road, but I think if anything, you know, it's more depth and that's a really good red zone target. He's big, great at contested catches. They also add Miles Sanders. They haven't really had, I mean, they've had pass catching backs, but they're all kind of like redundant in that they're not great in that side of the game. Like they're all able to catch passes, of course, but you add Miles Sanders to the game. I think he gives an element to this backfield that they didn't have over the last couple of years. So J.J. Arcega Whiteside, Miles Sanders, Deshaun Jackson, they used uh, their first round pick on Andrew, Andre Dillard to shore up that left tackle spot if Jason Peters moves on or if they just need depth. So I absolutely love what they did this offseason. I think Carson Wentz is probably the steal of the draft at quarterback. This is pretty much the same thing I said for Matt Ryan last year. He balled out. So go grab Carson Wentz everywhere you can in your drafts. I know it's very early, but he's just someone to keep an eye on that if you do see later in the line down the summer, um, you know, dynasty leagues, best ball, whatever, grab Carson Wentz right now, please. Number two on this list, if there is someone that is not being talked about enough, more than this guy, drop a comment down below. I haven't heard a single, a single, single, single thing about Austin Eckler, the running back for the Los Angeles Chargers behind Melvin Gordon. Last year, he finished as the running back 24 in fantasy. That would make him a legitimate RB2 in 12-team leagues. Right now, his ADP, running back 44, on draft.com, 115th overall. It actually might be lower than that now. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, I'm sorry, but it's it, it's like pick 42 or later or something like that um, at, at the running back position. So he is going so much further down his ADP. And that, that I mean, best ball is great because you don't have to actually start it. You don't have to choose when to start somebody. So Eckler has his good games and he has his bad games. You don't have to decide when to start him. So I think he's a phenomenal best ball pick, but I also think he's a great season long pick at this point. When you're looking at why Eckler is dropping. I mean, obviously, you know, he's one of those like scat back plus, right? He's built to play a secondary role, but he can also run the ball very effectively. I think a lot of the, the hate or the undervaluing is coming into play because Melvin Gordon got hurt last year and Austin Eckler was given the chance to explode as that featured back and he didn't wow people. He didn't really impress and he didn't blow up to the point that, you know, Melvin Gordon owners who had handcuffed Eckler or people who picked up Eckler off the waiver wire were not impressed with what he did. And so so in their minds, they're like, oh, you know what? He doesn't actually have any sort of upside that we had hoped in case Melvin Gordon got hurt. But that, that was never really Eckler's, you know, game. He was never going to be a workhorse, and that's fine. We see the way that the NFL is going. Like, you don't need to have a workhorse back in order to have a, a good fantasy back. He's 5'9", 199 pounds. So there was no way that he was ever going to be a workhorse in the NFL. I, I also think that it has to do with him missing time, right? Just like Melvin Gordon, Eckler has missed multiple games in both of his seasons so far. He missed two games um, last year, and that was a year after his rookie campaign in which he fell three games short of a full 16-game slate. So three games, two games, uh, not massive total numbers missed, but still, you don't want to see a total of five games missed over the first two years. If you're looking at his numbers from last year, though, like I said, he was RB24 overall. A full 16-game pace of Eckler would have had him right under uh, 1,100 total yards from scrimmage and seven touchdowns, and I think that's absolutely someone that you want to have after pick 100, right? Or after pick 110, 115. And obviously, if you're a Melvin Gordon owner, uh, he's going to be someone that you should draft a round or two earlier. I just grabbed him in my dynasty league in which I grabbed Melvin Gordon in the first round and then got Austin Eckler. Thank God. I was like moving back. I wasn't sure when to take him. I was like, as early as like the 10th round, I was like, I should probably grab Eckler here. I waited, I waited, I waited. I ended up getting him in like at like 12.06 or something. So I'm really happy about that. The other thing is like, especially if you're in a dynasty league, Austin Eckler is... 23 or he turns 24 today i believe while i'm filming this so happy birthday austin eckler shout outs to you if you're in uh, brooklyn and you happen to see this literally during your birthday which is impossible considering this was going out four days after your birthday but i still love you dog he just turned 24 and he was an undrafted free agent right so that means he doesn't get the typical rookie deal in which you you know you sign for four years and then you get the team option or whatever for the fifth year he actually signed a three-year deal, so he will be a free agent as early as this offseason. So if you are a dynasty player, that is definitely something to keep in mind because, uh, well, first of all, I, I believe he is a re restricted free agent, so there's a good chance he ends back up with Los Angeles, which is fine because he, you know, they know how to use him and he has a great role in that offense. But if they don't, like, there is probably going to be a team that invests money into Austin Eckler because he is such a good piece for an offense and such a good weapon to have. When you look at his numbers, man, he has quietly been one of the NFL's most efficient backs since he's entered the league in 2017 as both a runner and a pass catcher. He averaged 5.5 yards per carry in 2017, and he more than doubled his carry total in 2018 and upped 
or, or kept his yards per carry above five. So 5.5, more than doubled his carry total, 5.2 yards per carry. He averaged 10.3 yards per reception in 2017, which was sixth highest among all running backs with at least 25 catches. And that's a big number for an RB. And normally you're like, hey, you know, that number's probably going to come down. That's probably not um, something that you're capable of, you know, keeping up with because that's a very high, every time he was catching a pass, it went for 10.3 yards at the running back position. It's a big number. Um, but then he did it again last year. He upped his, ca- <coughs> excuse me, his catch total by more than 12 catches and his yards per reception went from 10.3 to 10.4. Obviously not a huge increase, but the fact that he was able to keep it up there and that was actually third in the NFL among running backs tells you that he's just an efficient, explosive playmaker at all times. Um, he was number one among NFL running backs last year in terms of breakaway run rate per playerprofiler.com. 9.4% breakaway run rate, which means 9.4% of his carries went for 15 or more yards last year. Number one in the NFL among running backs. Almost 10% of his carries went for 15 plus yards. He was fourth in the NFL last year in yards per touch. The guy doesn't need 20 touches per game in order to be a good fantasy flex option for you. I, I think the biggest blowback will be, you know, what about Austin Eckler Light? What I mean by Austin Eckler Light is Justin fucking Jackson. Do the Chargers have any plans on having Justin Jackson's Playtime eat into Austin Eckler's? I think hell no. Jackson played on more than 37% of the snaps last year just once. And that was week 15 when both Eckler and Melvin Gordon were out. And uh, it was against the Chiefs. Jackson averaged 3.6 yards per carry that game. And that was against KC again, which was one of the worst defenses in the NFL last year. Uh, When Gordon was out, you look at any of the games in which it was just Eckler and Justin Jackson. Eckler was seeing a near 75% snap split. Jackson is a sub 200 pound back, just like Eckler. He was a seventh round pick. He basically is a similar player to Austin Eckler, but he does everything a little bit worse. So yeah, for those of y'all who will be like, well, Eckler's an undrafted free agent, so how are you gonna make the argument that Justin Jackson is a seventh round pick? But Eckler already carved out his role. That's the hard part. If you're an undrafted free agent or a seventh round pick, carving just making the roster and carving out a role is the difficult part. Eckler already has that. So Justin Jackson is still in an uphill battle. The only reason he really saw playing time last year was because of injuries to Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler. He had a couple, like one or two good games, maybe. Um, he had one like big efficient game against Pittsburgh, but uh, he was not impressive otherwise. And I still think Austin Eckler absolutely handles that RB2 role there. Um, and I think he's a sneaky good play that you can grab in, in the double digit rounds and be a great flex play. And if something happens to the injury prone-ish Melvin Gordon, then I would absolutely do yourself a favor and grab Eckler because he will be a 15 to 18 touch guy Not huge volume in games where Gordon isn't there, but he's so efficient that those touches will be very good fantasy numbers for you. So Austin Eckler, Carson Wentz, my two favorite, you know, post-type sleepers or bounce back players or guy, I guess just like undervalued pretty much um, so far. So if you're enjoying the big facts, if you're finding value from these things that I'm just yelling at you about, uh, I I ask you again, please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you are new. I do want to plug something real quick because if you are enjoying these big facts, if you think these are any good, do yourself a favor and go cop the big dogs draft guide every summer we put out a fantasy football draft guide it's basically an online magazine an online website that gives you a hell of a lot of exclusive content that i put out that i do not put out on youtube it's so literally got all my rankings my top 250 big board positional rankings by tiers broken down by tiers for ppr half ppr standard so all your le- it's got all those in there again Broken down by tiers, it has my top busts, my top sleepers, my must-draft players with in-depth analysis like I'm doing in these videos. It's got my top resources and websites to use, whether you're trying to find injury things, stats, depth charts, like everything that I personally use, I want to give to y'all, as well as my Big Dogs Bible, which is like an 8,000 word essay, basically how to attack your season long fantasy draft position by position. It's got like 38 other things that I promise you guys are really going to enjoy and and the value is so, 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 so worth it for y'all. So go cop that Big Doig, Big Doigs, (laughs) Big Dogs Draft Guide.com. There's actually two draft guides up if you are in Dynasty Leagues, there's also a Dynasty Draft Guide, but you'll see that on the site as well. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. If you cop before June 1st, you'll be getting a 20% off discount of the launch price. I love y'all. Let's get to number three on this list. Marvin Jones, the wide receiver out of Detroit. Last year, finished as the wide receiver 61 overall, obviously because of the injury that shortened his 2018 campaign. He was wide receiver 25 in terms of fantasy points per game half PPR. Right now, he's getting picked as wide receiver 35, 85th player off the board on draft.com. 
Com. I like Matt Stafford for a bounce back this year. I like this whole offense for a big bounce back in 2019. A lot of it has to do with just the fact that they had a lot of injuries and a lot of uncertainty in that offense, right? With Garrett Blunt taking Karrion Johnson's fucking carries and Golden Tate getting traded midway through the season. Marvin Jones going down with injuries. Then Bruce Ellington steps into the slot for Tate, gets injured. Like a lot of nonsense going on there. The one constant there was that they've been building up this offensive line for a couple of years now. It was still really good last year, despite the offensive woes. So that is the one constant. And I love that about an offense for a uh, for a bounce back. Jones just turned 29. So he is definitely at the tail end of his prime in his career. Um, but at 29 is definitely not an age, not like running backs where you need to write off wide receivers when they are 29 years old. So he's still very much in it. He only played in nine games last year. It was really like eight and a half because he suffered a bone bruise, a serious bone bruise, which led to surgery. And we actually talked about it, um, in my video with Dr. Jesse Morse, who came on my channel a few weeks ago, which I will link in the description. You can just go find, um, that on my channel players to avoid and target based on injuries or whatever. And he's not concerned about Marvin Jones going into the year. Uh, all reports are saying that he will be ready for OTA. So I'm not worried about his injury and him coming back for this season based on last season. He has played in 47 games of a possible 48 prior to 2018. So he's definitely not like an injury concern or anything. Now, Kenny Galladay is absolutely the alpha there in Detroit. Now, I am not arguing that. And I don't hate that at all because Jones is not really built to be a wide receiver one, right? He's not a prototypical wide receiver one, although he did prove that in 2017 that he really could do that if he needs to. But now that Kenny Galladay is going to be drawing the cornerback ones on opposing defenses, Jones can do what he's meant to do. And that's like hitting those Deshaun Jackson type numbers in his prime of his career. Just stretch the field. And Marvin Jones, like, right, we saw that he had multiple productive years at a very young age while operating as a wide receiver two behind, you know, AJ Green in Cincinnati, including that t 10 touchdown campaign back in 2013. And Jones really wasn't bad last year. He averaged nearly 11 half PPR fantasy points per game, which lands him about wide receiver 25 in um, in last year's rankings, which I already kind of said to you guys, among guys that played in at least eight games, which he did. If you don't count that final game, which I said he left with injury, right? His points per game numbers boosted him up to around wide receiver 20. So he was a lot better than people expected. They just see the, the, the older age and they see that he ended the year on an injury. So they're nervous about that. But I'm not really as nervous as the public is, right? And we always fade the public over here at the HQ. Do I think he has wide receiver one upside like he did in 2017, like he produced in 2017? Not a fucking chance. But I mean, then again, I actually wouldn't be surprised if he put up similar end of season numbers as he did in that 2017 campaign where he was a wide receiver one. The only reason he was... A wide receiver one in fantasy during that season was because the overall position was miserable in fantasy. He only averaged 12.2 fantasy points per game that year, which was not that much more than he did last year. So um, people got really hyped on Marvin Jones last year because of his ridiculous 2017, which wasn't really as good as people think it was. Uh, but it wouldn't, like I said, I don't think it'd be a stretch to see him produce similar numbers to what he did that year 16 61 catches 1100 yards nine touchdowns do i think he hit those numbers probably not but they'll be similar for a price that you can get um you know like 40 picks later and then just looking at this chart i, I kind of wanted to see what this offense was doing overall right because obviously with matt patricia coming in they want to use the ground game more and we saw that last year right their pass attempts were pulled back a little bit um, especially near the red zone, we saw them starting to feed their running backs there and wanting to just give carry on and like Garrett Blunt for whatever fucking reason, more carries. Matt Stafford's red zone attempts and his attempts inside the 10 yard line, so the 10 zone, have started to go down in recent years. And last year in 2018 was by far the lowest total of both red zone and 10 zone attempts he's ever had in a season. I think just by default, we're going to see those numbers increase a bit in volume. And, you know, if that's the case, that's great news for Marvin Jones because he is constantly Matt Stafford's top target down there. I know you might say Kenny Galladay because you think that he's big and he has a size and he does, of course, but Marvin Jones is a better red zone target and Matt Stafford has that chemistry with him down there. Marvin Jones only played in eight and a half games last year and he still tied Kenny Galladay for the, uh, the team lead in targets inside the 10 zone with six. If you pace that number out to a full 16 games, Marvin Jones is top three in the NFL among wide receivers in 10 zone targets. And speaking of targets, right, Golden Tate, of course, is gone. So that'll free up targets overall. Of course, they do add in TJ Hawkinson, who is a big tight end. And I'm really excited to see what they do with him. 
But, you know, if you're being reasonable, you can't really project TJ Hawkinson to make a major. He's not going to put up anywhere near the type of volume that Golden Tate had during his prime years. So at least for 2019, which is what we're talking about right now, TJ Hawkinson will not produce what Golden Tate put up. So I like Marvin Jones more in that sense from both a volume and efficiency standpoint than a lot of people do. Like I said, man, a lot of people are going to be down just because the Lions offense and the Lions passing game looked really, really bad. But I think this is a case of recency bias and you can't completely, you know, write it off. If you look at what Matt Stafford has here, man, it's a really solid group of weapons. Marvin Jones, TJ Hawkinson, Kenny Galladay, Carrion Johnson, a top eight pass blocking line per PFF um, with a chance to be even better, right? I love the the young offensive lines that perform really well because that just means one more year of continuity will make them an even stronger line. That's where I usually see the production. Like a lot of times you'll hear about these offensive lines that are great, but they're of an older age. And those are the reasons why they usually fall off. Well, you look at these younger lines who perform really well and they're all together for the next year as well. Those are usually prime for a semi, like a breakout, if you want to say. Better line, gives Stafford more time, gives Stafford more time, which is great for Jones because he's now going against cornerback twos who, you know, that's that his, his, his best portion of his game is stretching the field. Give Stafford more time. That will give Jones more time to work on these lesser cornerbacks down the field. I love it. I think he's a great pick around wide receiver 35, 36. That can easily finish 10 spots higher in the rankings than his current ADP allows. So we got Carson Wentz, Austin Eckler. We got Marvin Jones as guys that are undervalued, bounce back, post type sleepers. I know they're not the most exciting names, but I think they will give you great value. You know, it just has depth plays on your fantasy rosters. Again, if you are enjoying this, make sure you hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're new, bigdogsdraftguy.com. Go check that out. Let's talk about some honorable mention players. Um, I had Larry Fitzgerald on this list for the Cardinals. That was prior to the NFL draft and them taking like six wide receivers. Dude, the Cardinals are, in a, as much as I want to love what they did in the NFL draft and what they're doing this offseason in terms of just flipping the script on their offense, for them to go with three of their top six round picks on wide receivers completely fade the offensive line. I know they added some pieces this summer, but all the guys that they added this summer are are not good offensive linemen. Um, they did not draft. They did not make uh, drafting offensive linemen a priority this year, and they must have known that Patrick Peterson was going to get a ban. Right? You always hear like when you hear a suspension come out, and then you'll be like, "Oh no, no wonder that team signed this wide receiver." That it sounded weird at the time, but they must have known the suspension was coming. The Cardinals must have known that Patrick Peterson was getting suspended. They were already a horrible passing defense last year, and now they're without you know an elite cornerback. The fact that they just faded all these things in the draft and just decided to go heavy on wide receivers is telling about what this offense is going to be, which is great for fantasy, but it's just like, this team might be fucking horrible again in 20, uh, 2019. Looking at Larry Fitzgerald, he finished as wide receiver 30 overall last year. Wide receiver 37 in half PPR points per game. But if we're going to give an, a, a complete pass on this offense to David Johnson and we're high on Kyler Murray and we love Christian Kirk, there's no reason why Larry Fitzgerald should not get at least a little bit of a pass, right? He finished last year as wide receiver 30, currently being picked as wide receiver 43 overall, 105 on draft. Gets a one-year $11, $11 million deal. Um, you know, I brought a lot of these things up already. It's just the Arizona Cardinals are going to be running so many more plays on offense this year. And when you look at Cliff Kingsbury brings to this offense, I'm looking at his college numbers over the last five years or so, and they love using the slot receiver. Jakeem Grant, Kiki QT, put up monster numbers in the slot under Cliff Kingsbury over the last five years. Those are dominant college numbers, right? You don't see like, I mean, Jakeem Grant and Kiki QT in their final years, 90 for 1350 and double digit touchdowns. Those are monster college numbers, but even the other years are, are really good considering obviously they play in less games. The slot is a massive part of Cliff Kingsbury's offense where Fitz nearly ran 70% of his routes last year. Does he have top 12 upside? Absolutely not. Like he did in 2015 to 2017, adding all these new pieces in a lot of new, you know, a lot of new stuff implemented to this offense. But it would not surprise me whatsoever if Fitz Loki finished as like a top 25 PPR fantasy wide receiver this year. And he's someone that you can get in Dynasty. And like, I, I'm pretty sure he's still on the board. It's a 15th round. If you ended up fading wide receiver for the most part and you need instant production, I really like Larry Fitzgerald to outperform where people think he will. I know he's old and I know he's lost a step, obviously, but I, I still think he's plenty good and will uh, have plenty of volume in this offense and a passing offense that's going to, you know, throw the ball in like 65 to 70% of their plays. Another veteran wide receiver I like that operates in the slot is Golden Tate of the newly New York Giants. 
Am I a fan a fan of this of this signing overall? Mm, am I running out to target him in my drafts? Also, probably not. But I will probably own Golden Tate because I'm um, I'm assuming he's going to fall in almost every season long draft, and I will own him in like one or two spots just because I would like to get a share in case you know he does surprise a lot of people. He's been one of the premier playmakers in the NFL. You know, it, over the course of his career, he was traded by Detroit in like late October. Goes to Philly and really disappoints. Um, when Tate left Detroit, he was their leading receiver. He was playing really well at the beginning of that year. 517 yards, 44 receptions to his name. He was commanding 26.6% of the targets in Detroit at that time. He started off absolutely on fire. Like I said, he goes to Philly, doesn't fit. Signs a four-year, $37 million contract with the Giants, who obviously just got rid of Odell Beckham. So a lot of targets are up for sale. They already you know, have Sterling Shepard who operates as a slot receiver, but will obviously asked to be, um, will be asked to run a lot more routes on the outside under Pat Shermer. And I was looking at some numbers and under Pat Shermer last year, he ran nearly 42% of his snaps from the outside, not in the slot. That's Sterling Shepard. And yeah, OBJ missed some time, but um, he only missed four games and he missed almost all of 2017. And Shepard was only a 23 and a half percent outside guy, not under Shermer. So Shermer's obviously going to use him a lot more on the outside, let Tate probably operate on the inside. And that's going to be, I think, the focus of this offense, right? They're kind of pulling away from those deep targets and those deep threats, um, such as like OBJ and Eli Manning is just not really suited to throw the long ball. He has been like outside of the top 20 in terms of deep ball accuracy per PFF over the last like five years. His average depth of throw has been 7.8 or fewer in each 7.8 yards or fewer in each of the past two seasons, which ranks 30th or worse among NFL quarterbacks in that span. So I think that fits with Tate's game. Is he going to be an awesome like fit? Is he going to be an every week wide receiver two for you? No, but if he catches 75 to 80 passes, 900 yards and, you know, four or five touchdowns, that wouldn't surprise me. So PPR leagues do not look past Golden Tate, even though he's on this new team. A couple other guys I kind of don't hate. Um, Just that that Tampa Bay Bucks backfield between Peyton Barber, Ronald Jones. I think someone will emerge. I like the offense overall, or at least on paper in theory with Bruce Arians. They did not add anyone through the NFL draft. I know they added Bruce Anderson through free agency. Guys, he's an undrafted free agent. Didn't catch passes in college. Is not particularly fast for his size. So you can get excited about him, but I'm not putting a lot of stock in that. Peyton Barber was surprisingly good last year. If you look at just efficiency numbers, you know, yards created per attempt and missed tackles forced per attempt were top 10 in the NFL. Ronald Jones is another guy that like, I did not like him coming into the class, but, uh, and, and I mentioned this in one of my videos, I think last week, there was a podcast I listened to and it was a high stakes DFS player. One of that player's friends owns a club out in Vegas or, or, or LA or something, called the DFS player and said, yo, stop drafting Ronald Jones. Ronald Jones is at my club right now, eating cheeseburgers and getting drunk. And it was like a couple weeks before the season started or before the preseason kicked off. He's like, this guy's not ready for the NFL. Stop drafting him. And it makes sense given that he was the youngest running back, you know, coming out of the draft class last year. He was just not mature enough, not ready. Hopefully what happened last year and that he was such a disappointment, got like 25 carries or something total in the rookie year. He's like, I need to prepare differently. He can come in as a different player this year and and carve out a real role in which it's a 50-50 split backfield. And if that's the case, you know, in a high powered offense, supposedly, Um, someone with a 50-50 split might be able to give you, you know, flex numbers. So I like Peyton Barber. I like Ronald Jones, both guys who are going like outside of the 14th round, which is, is kind of crazy. Geronimo Allison, another guy I like has, you know, has never played double digit games in a year, but he was on fire with Aaron Rodgers over the first four or five games of last year before he got hurt and was placed on the IR. But he was very good in the limited time that he was there last year. They did not add anything through free agency or through the draft, which tells you they're comfortable with what they have. And uh, I don't think they think they have anything special between Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Equinemius St. Brown, or Jamon Moore. So I think they're going to be depending on Geronimo Allison to be that wide receiver too outside of Devontae Adams. They could have went out inside John Brown or something like that to be a field stretcher, but they didn't. So I really like Geronimo Allison as a later, later pick. The risk is definitely there in terms of injury. So I'm not going to jump up into like the ninth round to grab him based on some hypothetical ceiling of him playing 16 games. Definitely got to keep an eye on should have asked Dr. Jesse Morse about drawing my Allison when I talked to him. One guy I did ask about, Anthony Miller, wide receiver, Chicago Bears. I love this guy coming out. I thought he was like, he was my favorite wide receiver prospect coming out last year. Scored seven touchdowns as a rookie with having a separated shoulder, which you can't really raise your arm. So go check out the video I did with Dr. Jesse Morse. Again, I will link that down below. Go check my channel out for that. 
He, uh, we talked about Anthony Miller, so he's a guy that I'm very excited about coming into his second year, coming to the second year of the offense. Um, overall, just there should be more chemistry there, and uh, I think he'll take over most of Taylor, Taylor Gabriel's slot or snaps uh, that he had in that offense for whatever fucking reason. So I'm excited about him as well. So those are a bunch of guys that I think are you know possible bounce back players that are more under the radar, post type sleeper type guys. Um, if you have any on your radar, I would love to hear them down below. Make sure you drop that comment, and I will argue with you about why the fuck you're wrong and everything I said was right. I'm just kidding. I'd like to hear all your guys' feedback. Again, if you enjoyed this, uh, I would very much appreciate a thumbs up. If you're listening via podcast, you know you could subscribe to the podcast, leave a rating and review. That would help me out. Let's me know you appreciate the work that I'm putting in over here at the HQ. I'm nervous for June, man. Five videos a week. Stay tuned. Stop yelling. Tuck your shirts in. Go cop the draft guide. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. That is it for today. I will see y'all on Thursday for the public, baby. We out. Peace.